Hi, and thanks for joining us to better understand the energy systems, how we can focus training to improve each system, and some of the intricacies around event-specific energy system training that will hopefully broaden our appreciation for the place each energy system plays in our chosen event area. My name's Steve Kane, a former decathlete, now coach, and I can recall quite vividly my first real exposure to the concept of energy systems. It was back in high school, P class, many years ago, and I mentioned this as, a, as the fundamentals from this era remain consistent with how we understand the energy systems to work today. This being said, I'm glad you're on this journey with us today as what has evolved in recent years are various training methods and an increased appreciation for the contribution of all three energy systems for all events. Stay with us and we'll delve deeper into some practical event specific examples of how we can utilize energy systems training for ultimate performance outcomes. But first, let's recap some of the basics. So our three main energy systems are the alactic, lactic, and aerobic. And as we go through, we may reference the alactic as the ATP PC, uh, likewise the lactic as the glycolytic, and we'll try to stick with the aerobic for the aerobic energy system. What once was thought to operate like a manual car with each system working as an independent gear, switching from one to another as our exercise progresses, we now appreciate not to be the case. Rather, all three systems work simultaneously, where it's just the percentage contribution of each that varies. This variation is underpinned predominantly by our exercise duration, with exercise intensity and recovery times also of influence. Through fatiguing factors such as oxygen jet, oxygen debt, and hydrogen ion buildup, our capacity to maintain exercise intensity, intensity is compromised. Hence, we are forced to respond with a decrease in intensity to maintain prolonged exercise output. We're all intimately familiar with this scenario. Whether in the classic example of a 400 or 800 sprint, when we go and pedal to the metal from the get go, sooner realize a bear has jumped on our back and the finish line can't come soon enough. Or that extended run for the last bus or train where you're forced to slow down and perhaps catch your breath. Or the smart approach to a marathon where slow and steady wins or maybe just finishes the race. These are all examples of how duration and intensity will determine what proportion each energy system is contributing at any point in time. But let's not forget, and I'll try and mention it a few times, all energy systems are working all the time. In the coaching profession, we believe that where focus goes, energy flows, and hopefully improvements will show. It's our hope that should we focus our training efforts on improving technique, that technique does in fact improve. It's also the case with the energy systems whereby we expect to see an energy system improvement in energy output and perhaps efficiency if we appropriately train the relevant system. So let's have a look at each system a little closer with respect to specific events that rely more heavily on each system. The alactic system basically means we don't produce lactic acid as a byproduct. It's our body's system of choice for short bursts of intensive exercise because of its high rate of energy production. The trade-off is our very small storage of fuel, limited to around eight seconds, or potentially a few seconds longer if used at lower intensities. But in short, rapid energy production for a short period of time. A quick recap of the biology at play here. So we're producing ATP, adenosine triphosphate, so three phosphate molecules. These are our little bundles of energy produced from our stores of adenosine diphosphate and phosphocreatine, where our additional phosphate iron comes from. And that's about as deep as we'll go into any of the biology today. What's important to note from an event perspective is that these energy stores can recover partially around half capacity in 30 seconds, but near full recovery will take two to three minutes. And that's passive recovery. So we're looking at standing, sitting, walking, but ideally not jogging. On the slide, you can see a few examples of how we can train the alactic system. Noticing an assumed 
high intensity for explosive med ball throws and flying 30 meter sprints. With the flying 30 meters, I'd be suggesting these figures as absolute minimal rest between reps if we're looking to maintain quality. Again, assuming high speed running and alactic energy system training is the session focus. We can add to this list various strength and conditioning sessions where our intensity is high and our rep range is low. For example, pumping out some bench press with four sets of three reps at 85% intensity or one RM with three to five minutes rest between sets. So full recovery period and intensive effort duration within the eight to 10 second window of ADP storage. Another example of where the importance of the alactic system might be relevant is when distance runners are looking to improve their top end speed capacity. In one way, similar to team sports such as AFL, rugby and the like, where there's often a bias, particularly of these team sports that to consider training sessions valuable, there must be that fatigued feeling that justifies the effort, sometimes referenced as the hard slog. In a similar way, distance runners smashing out repeated sprints with active recovery. These typically repeat effort sessions that may look something like 20 reps of max intensity 30 meter sprints with, let's say 15 seconds jog back recoveries, doesn't really align with the alactic system due to inefficient recovery periods. Hence, we wouldn't expect to see optimal improvements in the functionality of the alactic system with sessions like this. It's not to say this style of training doesn't have its own value, but it's more to point out that the context is important and if a specific outcome is required, the programming and modalities should be designed to match. One consideration that goes hand in hand with the alactic system considering the high intensities associated with quick explosive efforts is neural fatigue. A topic in itself that's not within the scope of our energy system discussions today, but one we should acknowledge in this space as it can have a detrimental effect on intensity and performance when present. This list of events indicates short duration explosive events with the rapid production of energy required. They align well with our eight second window of alactic energy dominance, not forgetting that all three energy systems work simultaneously. We could extend this list to potentially include the 400 meters as all 400 coaches would value that eight second energy contribution to any race. However, we'll look specifically at the 400 a little later to better understand why it's not a priority on this list. If we draw our focus to the field events in particular, there is no denying the alactic system is the most important for performance, again, due to the intensity and duration of these events. To give you some further insight, our jump events generally comprise of four phases, the run up, takeoff, flight phase and landing. The run up is likely five-ish seconds in length, combined with the takeoff, flight phase and landing, all completed in around six seconds and often under pending the specific event, as obviously the flight phase of the pole vault will be a little longer than that of a long jump. The throws are even shorter with javelin the longest duration of all, with a run up component lasting around four to five seconds for most elite throwers. Even the hammer throw inclusive of preliminary swings is over in about the same time, with discus and shot put a mere one to two seconds of max effort. On top of this, athletes receive a full recovery period between rounds. As we progress the duration of our exercise beyond 10 seconds, the lactic acid energy system becomes the predominant contributor of energy and remains as such for up to 60 seconds. With carbohydrates, carbohydrates as its only fuel source, it produces more ATP than the alactic system via anaerobic glycolysis. But it comes with limitations such as its slower rate of energy production. Anaerobic being the absence of oxygen and glycolysis being the breakdown of glucose to produce ATP. Anaerobic glycolysis produces lactic acid as a byproduct of its energy production and is commonly known to limit high intensity exercise duration. But more specifically, the increase in hydrogen ion concentration is what 400 meter runners know all too intimately. As far as recovery periods for the lactic or glycolytic system, Partial recovery can take eight to 10 minutes 
whilst full recovery, depending on circumstances, can take over 30 minutes, ideally with a light active recovery as opposed to complete rest. To put this in some event specific context, the example we have here of two sets of three by 200 meter sprints at near maximum intensity with insufficient rest periods for full recovery is certain to elicit some serious fatigue and challenge the efficiency of the glycolytic system. The longer rest period between sets is to try and maintain the high intensity and target pace for the session whilst challenging the system to recover efficiently. When we consider this system to be predominantly between 10 and 16, uh, sorry, 16, maybe 60 seconds, and lasts for up to three minutes of exercise, we appreciate these events have a strong reliance on glycolysis and, on another note, bring with them particularly the training required. A feeling of, well, maybe this is just me, a, a feeling of pain and challenge, both physical and mental. After bringing back the memories of being hunched over on the side of the track week after week, the aerobic or oxidative energy system is a breath of fresh air, which, thanks segue, is required for aerobic glycolysis. So oxygen is required. The aerobic system also utilizes the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain to produce ATP. It produces energy slower than the two previous systems, but for far greater durations, being the predominant energy system for exercise longer than 60 seconds and reliant on fuel stores, which for full recovery can take 12 to 48 hours. Three main fuel stores here are our carbohydrates, fats, and protein. So our quantity of fuel storage is much higher than other systems. Again, we have some example training sessions, though we could include an endless list of not only running, but gym and fitness workouts too, provided a prolonged duration and minimal recoveries, which in turn would assume lower exercise intensities. A big part of this system is the efficient transport of oxygen to the working muscles from the heart, the lungs, and eventually to the muscles. And we acknowledge its importance in any event longer and including the 400. So just to recap thus far, we have been identifying what events each energy system contribute to. And I guess to be completely accurate, we always revert to the understanding that all energy systems are working simultaneously. So let's move on from that and identify the predominant energy system for specific events. Let's start with the less controversial. So our field events. Due to their duration and maximal intensities are fueled predominantly by the alactic system. So too for the 100 meters, especially at the elite level. Where at developing levels, if a runner is say running 13 seconds or perhaps slower, is likely to have an even contribution from both the alactic and the lactic acid systems. The other is easy to identify uh, with events that are longer, so maybe the 300, but even, sorry, 300 to 3000, but even more so the 5K, the 10K, and for aerobic dominance, of course, the marathon. The 400 though, often attracts a passionate debate about what energy system is the most important. I won't personally weigh in too heavy on this one, but there have been plenty of studies that have measured the aerobic contribution to a 400 meter race, with some suggesting it's the most important and others suggesting the lactic system takes majority honors here. Either way, there's no denying its important contribution and perhaps slightly more important for females due to slightly longer average race times. Before we wrap up, it's important we maintain a holistic perspective and apply our understanding of energy systems in a practical manner. It should be clear by now that every energy system is important to every athlete and perhaps a justified way of constructing a training plan is to ensure the time spent training an energy system is directly proportional to its percentage contribution to performance outcomes. If we delve a little deeper to this question, should the training plan of a thrower or jumper only work the ATP-CP energy system? 
we can start looking at things like blood flow, heart rate, resting heart rate, and lactate thresholds as part of the equation. If we take a thrower, for example, an explosive athlete that relies predominantly on the alactic system, workload and training capacity is an important piece of their puzzle. Aerobic fitness is an important factor for their recovery. For if, say, athlete A can get twice the workload done as athlete B with sufficient recovery and relevant adaptation, of course, athlete A is likely to progress quicker. What do I mean by work capacity in this instance? Well, if athlete B has a resting heart rate of, let's say, 70 beats per minute, as well as a lactate threshold of 150 beats a minute, Athlete B has a work capacity zone of 80 beats per minute. In contrast, if athlete A has a resting heart rate of only 50 and a lactate threshold of 170, their work capacity is 120 beats per minute, which means they can get more work done and can recover faster. So in answer to this question, no. The training plan should not only work the ATP-CP system. This doesn't mean the thrower needs to go jog 30 minutes every second day to improve their aerobic fitness, far from it. We can manipulate a training session to maintain movement specificity and just adjust the rest periods to control intensities and heart rate. One method of justifying aerobic training in a session plan is to incorporate it in the general preparation phase with the aim to build greater work capacity. Another method of incorporating aerobic training for power events is, as I mentioned earlier, to reduce intensity, increase rep ranges, and shorten recovery. Weight circuits are a good example of this. Even bodybuilding, light bodybuilding, is an aerobic workout. Further than this, any training that's not intense, and we're keeping our heart rate around that 110 to perhaps 160, is an aerobic training session. It all comes back to what our intended outcome is. If we bring it back to our running example from earlier and the hard slog mentality of many team sports, you can either focus on high work quality or high work capacity in the zone. With these team sports, the winner is often the team that's fastest at the end of the game. In other terms, has better repeat sprint ability. So if you wanna run a five to 10 second sprint, you need to wait at least two to three minutes to run it fast again. If you want to run it for conditioning, go again in 45 seconds. That's your difference, quality or conditioning. It works the same in the gym. So if we're doing a high intensity gym session, keeping intensive efforts and rep ranges within 10 seconds, two to three minutes rest for near max recovery, you expect to achieve your quality outcome. If we increase rep ranges, decrease the rest to 45 seconds, now we're targeting conditioning of the alactic system, building work capacity and the ability to reproduce effort by recovering quicker. The difference between capacity and quality is really just the rest. Now, let's think about Jamie's situation for a minute. Jamie takes 65 seconds to complete a 400 meters. Therefore, Jamie only needs to train her aerobic energy system to improve her performances. What's your response? Now, if you like, you can press pause here and consolidate your thoughts and maybe even write them down. And if you've now done that, lovely work. And perhaps you may have responded with something along these lines. As you can see with the energy system contribution diagram, all three energy systems are working simultaneously. Their contributions will vary from the start to the end of the race, dominated initially by the alactic system, followed by a large contribution from the lactic acid system. These two systems are linked directly to Jamie's speed and high intensity efforts, so are vital to her ongoing capacity to improve. You may have also said that there is no doubt Due to the duration of effort, the aerobic system has a major contribution to the energy supply for a 65 second effort of running. But as it's clear that all three systems provide a valuable contribution, it makes perfect sense that we train all systems in search for performance improvements.